Hi, thanks for joining us online. We're always so grateful for the opportunity to connect with you, whether you're a regular here at LBCC, or maybe you're a fellow follower of Jesus Christ, or someone looking to learn more about Jesus and Christianity in general. Well, as a church, our aim is simple. First, we want to connect you to Jesus. He is the God who is the source of all life and goodness. And when you're connected to him, your whole life will change. And when you connect to him, you'll find that he wants to connect you to others, which is our goal too. You see, community is God's idea. We didn't come up with it. It's right there from the beginning of the story of scripture. Secondly, we wanna help you grow. Grow as a whole person. Uh, we want you to grow in your faith, obviously, and have a dynamic relationship with, with God through Jesus. But we want to see you grow in every aspect of your life. And part of that growth is when you join others on the journey of faith. There's something that happens when we work together, play together, and do things together that causes us to grow in relationship. And finally, we want to help you find ways to invest your life to be part of something bigger than yourself. You see, we were never meant to have life just be about us. It's really about learning to find a way to be part of something where you can impact the lives of others, whether it's your family at home, the people you work with in your neighborhood, your town or your city. We really want to see you get invested and impact your world. Now we hope you'll be encouraged by today's sermon, but first there's some information coming up here on upcoming events. Please look around our website, check out our YouTube channel, and hopefully we'll get to meet you sometime soon in person. God bless you, and may God's best be for you. Our Sunday service is back in person at 9.30 a.m. Masks are not required, but are encouraged for those who are unvaccinated. We also invite you to join one of our other events as an encouragement on your journey to connect, grow, and invest at LBCC. We host breakfasts for women and men on the second and fourth Saturday mornings. You can sign up at lbcovenant.org slash welcome slash upcoming dash events. Check out our life groups, a great way to meet and get to know us better. Some of them meet in person, some on Zoom. There are a couple times a month. And of course, visit our website or call the office at 732 732- 870-2028 to get info or ask for prayer. We'd love to help you in any way we are able. Now, here's today's sermon. It's good to be here. We're going to continue this morning uh, looking for a seventh time at the epistle, the first epistle of Paul to the Thessalonians. And we're going to look at the first part of chapter four this morning, where Paul continues to build on this theme of encouragement. We've looked at how he's commended them on how they heard the word, how they received the word in such trouble, um, how he consoled them through the difficult times they were going through, through the continued uh, opposition and affliction that they they found. We we like to use a word like challenges, right? They had some challenges because we don't like words like affliction and opposition. Uh, But that's what they dealt with, affliction and opposition. And he communicated to them how much they meant to him. He said, basically, he says, we cherish you. And so he's got this encouragement going for this church that was birthed in the midst of trouble and and, uh, turmoil. Um, And last week, we looked at uh, how joyful he was and the fact that their faith through all this remained solid. And he said how much he wanted to connect with them, how much he prayed for their growth and and desired to see them um, move toward maturity. And all of these obviously are very uh, applicable to our lives. So now in chapter four, he moves toward that faithful thing, application, application. So we're gonna gonna look at this at the the how uh, of what some of what Paul's saying. He begins in chapter 4 saying, finally then, or beyond that, because this is not the closing of the letter, but it's a closing of a thought, uh, uh, a series of thoughts. Finally then, brothers and sisters, we request and urge you in the Lord Jesus uh, that as you have received instruction from us as to how you ought to walk and please God, just as you actually do walk, 
that you excel even more. For you know what instructions we gave you by the authority of the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God, your sanctification. That is, that you abstain from sexual immorality, that each of you know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor, not in lustful passion like the Gentiles who do not know God, and that no one violate the rights and take advantage of his brother or sister in the matter, because the Lord is the avenger of all in all of these things, just as we also told you, told you previously and solemnly warned you. I think I have a typo there. For God has not called us for impurity, but in sanctification. Therefore, the one who rejects this is not rejecting man, but the God who gives his Holy Spirit to you. Now as to the love of the brothers and sisters, you have no need for anyone to write to you. For you yourselves are taught by God to love one another. For indeed, you practice it toward all the brothers and sisters who are in all Macedonia. But we urge you, brothers and sisters, to excel even more and to make it your ambition to lead a quiet life and attend to your own business and work with your hands just as we have instructed you so that you will behave properly toward outsiders and not be in any need. Amen. Let's pray together. Father, we, we pray that we would, we would be able to grasp uh, both the simplicity and the depth of what Paul is saying here, Lord. Uh, as, as we see your working with this church in Thessalonica, Lord, as we see how your spirit came upon them and they turned from idols to the living God, Lord, we pray that our lives would reflect the same, just as they imitated you and the apostles and the churches, Lord. We too want to imitate you and the apostles and the churches in our walk with you, Lord. So help us to understand this application and have the wisdom to apply it to our own lives. In Jesus' name. Paul makes it pretty simple here. He begins this passage and, and just explains his purpose very simply. He says, as you have received instruction from us to how you ought to walk and please God, just as you actually do walk, that you excel even more. Um, he, what he's saying is that as followers of Christ, there's a way you ought to live. There's a way you ought to live. And we could, we could come up with a bunch of titles for this. In fact, I've had like six different titles. It's one of those sermons where I, I set it up on, on uh, uh, YouTube and gave it a title. Then I had another title here, and then I changed that title, and I changed that title, and I changed that title. Right now, I'm going to just call it How to Live. But we could have called it the Christian lifestyle or the challenges of the Christian lifestyle, uh, the challenge to live like a believer. Uh, one writer calls it, said this, it's, it's, Paul is saying how we ought to thrive in the Christian ethic. Just counted a little hoity-toity to me, so I didn't use that. You know? Basically, he has one thought here. It's not two thoughts, uh, it's one. Conduct your lives in a manner pleasing to God, or live in order to please God. He's not, he's not saying you ought to walk and you ought to please God. Those things are one thing. You, know, you ought to walk in a way that is pleasing to God. And that, that is the call for our life. This is the application. It's like, if we know that what God's done for us, we see his word at work in us, then we ought to live a certain way. We ought to live a certain way. Paul and his team modeled the, uh, taught and modeled the gospel to them. And if we recall in chapter 2, he said, he did all this so that they would walk in a manner worthy of the God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. And what Paul does in this, if you remember in our first uh, session of this, the first uh, talk I gave on this, I gave you a bunch of key words. And he's using two of them here. He's saying that we, he's reminding them to remember what they were taught. You know, what we're looking at here, he's not saying this in a vacuum. They've already been taught this. He, he came to them, he shared the gospel with them, and then taught them, modeled for them, and taught them how to live. And he's saying, now reach for more. He says it twice in this passage. He says, you're doing well. 
reach for more. While many of Paul's letters spend time correcting the church, this isn't a correction. This is an encouragement and, and, a, and an exhortation to go beyond what they have. He's saying, don't settle for what you have in God's grace and power. Reach for more. This, that could be our, we could stop here, and that could be our lesson for today, couldn't it? Because we live in a world where it's just so easy to settle. Once you achieve something, you think, okay, I got it. I got it all together now, and I'm going to stay here. But no matter what God's done in your life, God wants to do more. Because he not only wants to do things for you, which he's done, he not only wants to do things in you, which he's doing, but he wants to do things through you, which he's doing and still wants to do. God is at work in our. And what's great is that Paul gives it to us in in something that we love. Don't we love easy steps for how to? Yeah, how to please God. Is it eight steps? Is it five steps? You know, we don't like a lot. He gives it to us in two steps. You know, I like two steps, two components, whatever you want to say. You know, I mean, face it, even seven habits of highly effective people, that's seven whole habits. You know, give me three, well, maybe two. Just give me one habit. If I just have one habit I could do, and then I'll be good, you know. Heck, John Maxwell, he's got a book out. I think it's 20 Principles of Leadership. 20? Come on. Let's go back to the seven, you know. So he gives us, he gives us two simple, simple thoughts, simple principles, simple words that tell us here's how to do it. And the first one is sanctification. He says, this is the will of God for you, your sanctification. What does God want for you? God wants you to be holy. He wants you to be being holy. He wants to let you progress in holiness. Sometimes when we talk about sanctification, that's one of the shun words, you know, justification, sanctification. These aren't the words you use when you're talking to somebody who doesn't know the Lord. Yeah. Even holiness, because this, you know, this is another word for holiness. This is God's will for you. Be holy. But what does that mean? You know, what does that mean? You know? Paul, Paul declares that we can know God's will. Um, we can see that God's will for us is simple, that he wants us to be holy, he wants us to be made holy, and he wants us to be progressing in our growth and holiness. We should be more like Jesus today than we were yesterday or the day before or last year. We should be more like him, and that's sanctification. You know, some, people, some people, I think back in the 70s, if you had a seminar, How to Know God's Will, you'd get 5,000 people to come to it because it was like God's will was this like, ooh, you got to find it there. That's because people were trying to figure out, should I wear the red socks today or the blue socks today? What's God's will? But God's will is simple. You should be holy. You should be sanctified. In fact, in Romans, Paul declared that as all Christians surrender themselves God, their minds enjoy an ever-growing ability to grasp what is will. You know, in Romans 12, too, he said, present yourself for the renewing of your mind. And God will work in you. Knowing God's will isn't this esoteric, heavenly mystery into only a select few might come into. Rather, knowing God's will is for every follower of Christ. And it's simple. Your sanctification. And then, then Paul unpacks that. And he gives us, now, you could have a whole bunch of examples, couldn't you? That you pray more, that you, that you uh, lo uh, do this more or that more. But he says one simple thing, that you abstain from sexual immorality. He goes right to the heart of it. He's like, if you're going to be different, if you're going to be like God and not like the world around you, don't be immoral. Don't be immoral. And it, one of the things here is this proves that in many ways the world has changed in 2,000 years. But in this way, it hasn't changed a bit, has it? You know, if you want to get at somebody's issues, talk about sex. Talk about purity. Talk about the things that make us squeamish talking about. 
Talk about your private lives and desires. And he goes right at it. He goes at the most overt way that God wants to change us and make us holy. He wants us to learn sexual purity. He wants us to be pure like he is. Um, one one uh, commenter said, it's probable that the first converts in Thessalonica had never even heard of such a strict view of sexuality to not practice Im immorality. We live in a world where being sexually pure is considered archaic or, or Victorian. You know? Back in the 70s, they were saying that most psychologists were spending time in their sessions with people trying to get people to let go of all these inhibitions that were on them because of the Victorian thinking or that sort of thing. And now, of course, it's the other way around. We can't get people to suppress their urges, to even control themselves in any way, shape, or form. We have, just like their culture, we have normalized um, uh, so uh, so few restrictions on sexuality that our culture's gone a little crazy with it. Maybe that's an understatement right there. He's saying, and he, we're saying, that there's no better way to live differently to express our devotion to God than at the place of our deepest desires. Our drives are that. And then he impacts it more. He says, he says that each of you know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor, not in lustful passion like the Gentiles who do not know God. Again, this is a single thought. Possessing your own uh, vessel in sanctification, in sanctification and honor isn't two thoughts, it's one thought. It's you should be in a place where you have control over your body, that it's pure. It's honor, honoring to God what you do with it. I think it could come down to a few questions for us. You know, do I have self-control? You know, am I driven by godly purity or am I driven by my body's desires? And what he does here is he contrasts them and us to the prevailing culture around them. He says, do this, live self-controlled, Live uh, guided by God's purity, not by your fleshly desires, like the world around you does. The world around you does what it wants to do, you know. And the truth is that those who don't know God are usually driven by their personal desires, whether it's sexual or, or whatever. Weren't you before you knew God? I know I was. I mean, maybe you were real good. I wasn't. I wasn't. I was driven by desires. I wanted that. And it was so different for me to say, oh no, that's not the way God wants me to live. And then learn to live that way. Not by repressing, but by being transformed. Yeah. The truth is learning that your sexual ethic, like all aspects of holiness, is rooted in God himself is where it starts. God is holy. That's why we should be holy. God is pure. That's why we should be pure. You know, we should, we should only allow ourselves to go after things that we should have the right to have. You know, Paul told the Corinthians, the body is not meant for sexual immorality, but your body is meant for the Lord and the Lord for the body. And then Paul goes on here and says that no one should viol and that no one violate the rights or take advantage of his brother or sister in the matter. Now this this is a much debated phrase. Some people switch it to something else, but really, uh, probably the easiest way to say it is that impure sexual practice is a path that leads to defrauding one's fellow believers. Obviously, any illicit sexual actions are wrong for a follower of Christ. Whether it's adultery in or out of the church, sexual activity in or out, outside of marriage, not inside marriage, outside of marriage. But what he's saying here is that whenever we are immoral, it not only affects us, but it affects everyone 
who has any connection to the either person involved in it, whether it's your spouse, your fiance, your family member, or fellow Christian. What he's saying here is that your purity and and righteousness before God in this matter, you're allowing yourself to be sanctified, affects all of us whether we know about it or not. The thought is we can be tempted to believe, well, if no one else knows, it's not affecting. But let's say this morning, we all have shoes and socks on, I think. Let's say inside those shoes and socks, which no one else can see, you have an infection in your little toe. And it really doesn't bother you, but it's a bad infection. You know, Leave it be for a while and see what it does to the rest of your body. Spiritually, that's what happens. When any of us think that we, it doesn't matter how we live you know, when, when no one can see, it affects the rest of us as believers in a number of ways. This principle is far-reaching. That's why, that's why if you cheat on your taxes, it affects me. If you lie, it affects me. Not directly, not today, maybe not something I can see, but you're part of my family and I'm part of yours. And, and that affects all of us. Why some people will posit that this particular thing is a, a, a slightly different subject, maybe about biz, business dealings or something, Something like that is because this principle is so far-reaching. But Paul hasn't changed the subject here. He's still talking about purity. He's still talking about holiness that results in sexual purity. And we are called to live different than the world around us. To, as it were, to walk to the beat of a different drum. And as God changes our lives... We, we, we are able to do that. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. I sometimes look back now and can't believe I lived the way that I did because living, living morally under God is normal for me. And things that didn't bother me before bother me now. I remember a number of years ago, I was telling Yvonne, I was having a conversation with the sister in the Lord and she was a kind of a touchy-feely person And was always, you know, putting her hands on me and stuff like that. And I'm like, I don't want another woman's hands on me. I want Yvonne. We won't, don't let your mind go anywhere. (laughs) I just want Yvonne. Because that's who I'm betrothed to. And purity is something that's normal for me now. And yet, impurity was so normal for me then. But that's sanctification, being made holy in God. Then Paul gives us our second. He says, so here's the will of God for you, sanctification. And then he goes on. It's, it, it, at first, it sounds like he's changing the subject, that we could have stopped uh, the, the passage there. But he goes on to say this. He goes on to talk about love. He says that Here's how we're going to find the will of God. Here's how we're going to live. Here's how we ought to conduct ourselves. Sanctification and love. If if living pure isn't enough of a challenge, now he tells us to love. And he tells us to love the church. (laughs) Brother Charles would be laughing with me. I think he means that, you know, love the people in the church who are the, one, the ones I agree with doctrinally. You know. Or maybe he means the ones I have the same, like the same kind of worship as me. You know. Or the ones who preach in a style that I like. No, no, he, he's basically saying, love the church. He says, he wasn't correcting them. He was, he was basically affirming them in who they were. You yourselves are taught by God to love one another. We urge you, brothers and sisters, to excel even more. They were an example of brothers and sisters who loved other brothers and sisters, even beyond their local church to their whole region. They were known for their love and laying down their lives for another. Uh, and he says, That's, you're such a great example, but listen, don't settle for what you have here. 
let it abound even more. Go over and above in your love. We, again, in our terminology, we might say thrive. Thrive in your love for one another. And then he goes from there, he expands it to the idea of loving, of loving others to, in our relationship to our community. He says, make it your ambition. This be your goal. This be something you want to do. To lead a quiet life, attend to your own business, and work with your hands, just as we instructed you so that you will behave properly toward outsiders and not be in any need. Even though I'm an outgoing person, very, I'm not a terse or quiet person, I blab a lot. I'm outgoing, I seem, you know, very people-oriented. There's times that this verse so appeals to me. I just want to live a quiet life work with my hands, know that I'm doing okay. You know? He's painting here a picture of responsible citizens. Have it be your ambition to live in a way full of love and expressing it not only to the church, but to the community around you. Live peaceably. He says live a quiet life. He's really talking about living peaceably in your community. Have any neighbors you have trouble getting along with? You should be finding ways to live peaceably with them. Find a way to have, ha, ha, make it work somehow. Attend to your own business. Um, we might use it. Don't concern yourself with meddling. You know? And, you know, nowadays everybody's meddling. You know, you say anything. It's up on the internet in five minutes, especially if you say something stupid, which I have proven to have a proclivity to do. That's why I don't say much on the internet. That kind of protects me from saying something stupid on the internet. Now, this, he's not ruling out, the, he's not talking about becoming a cloister. He's not talking about not having th anything to do with anything else. But he says, He's not ruling out the looking out for the well-being of others as he charged the, the church in, in both Colossa and, and in the Philippians. He, he's, telling us, he's telling us, don't be meddling. Do what you ought to be doing. And then he goes on to say, work with your hands. This was his example to them. He came in among them and work with their hands. Now, their society had a thing where wealthy people were expected to give and take care of other people, and there was a temptation. Anytime, anytime there's somebody with a lot of money willing to give it away, there's a temptation for the rest of us to say, well, I'll just take that and take it easy. Yeah. But what he's saying here is like, we should be in a place where we have a certain self-sufficiency. We're working. There's another, another place Paul says if someone won't work, they won't eat. You know, you ought to be doing work. This is part of where you can get the what's known as the Protestant work ethic from. That we ought to be working and, and taking care of ourselves, showing a good reputation to the, to the community around us. That we're not looking for anybody else to do this for us. We're relying on God and using the resources God has given us to care for ourselves and one another. You know? We don't want to be in need, and we want to be in a place where we can help others who are in need. That's, that's love at work. That's love at work, caring for one another. So Paul wraps it down to these two things, sanctification and love. And I think it's easy to just say that, okay, you need to be holy, you need to love one another. We know those commands. But I think we mean, need to make sure, uh, we need to make sure we understand that sanctification, God's work in us, and loving one another, God's work through us, um, doesn't come just natural. This is, everything he's saying here presupposes the knowledge of God and the work of the Holy Spirit. What he's, what he's saying here is for people who know God and whose lives have been transformed by God. You know, you know the church, 
in general, the church is known for condemning the world around us. We're known, whether it's a, a rightful reputation or not can be determined at a later date, but we're known in many places as those who condemn. We condemn the world for sexual impurity. But what he's saying here is if when you're called to Christ, you're called to sexual purity. Um, it's easy to condemn the, how the world lives. Paul says here, don't live like the Gentiles. He's saying this to Gentiles, mind you. He's saying, don't live like the world around you. Be sexually pure. Don't be immoral. Don't be driven by your desires. Um, but this is a call for those who know God and have the power of God to do it. Yeah. I can't tell you over the years how many Christians I've, you know, whether it's a, somebody struggling with pornography or something like that, you realize they're trying to deal with this without the Holy Spirit. They haven't been transformed inside and, and they haven't, this, th their sexuality hasn't been sanctified. And so they're trying to, by their own will, deal with the desires that need to be, they need to be set free of. And it's the power of God. You know, we need to know God to do that. The, the presupposition of this passage is, one, the Christian section, sexual ethic is based on God's calling. Holiness is rooted in God's person. And these qualities are for those who know God and have the ability to imitate him. Have received the Spirit's life-changing, empowering, life-changing empowerment. You know? He said it this way. You yourselves are taught by God to love one another. They, God spoke to them and their hearts received it. It wasn't just Paul and them, but they knew by the Spirit, this is the right thing to do. And he goes on to say, the one who rejects this is not rejecting men, but the God who gives his Holy Spirit to you. And if you wonder how he ties sanctification and love, look at this text. This is a very interesting text. In Romans 13, he says, for this... You shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet. Is there any other commandment, it is summed up in this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor, therefore love is the fulfillment of the law. So the law tells us to live purely, and it's seen through love. If I really love people, I won't, I won't treat them wrong, and treating them wrong would be to lust after them. Jesus said, person who looks on a woman in lust has already committed adultery in his heart. And so what we're talking about here is something that should be happening inside of us, not forced, out. it's not from the law, it's by the Spirit that we are changed. Sexual purity and love go hand in hand. Let me give you some closing thoughts I have here. Most of us, if not all of us, came into the kingdom of heaven having a warped view and perhaps very bad experiences with both of these issues. Most of us came in with a view of sexuality either marred by our, uh, our experiences or our own, own uncontrolled desires. Our experience is shaped by our own sin and the sin of others in our lives. Our understanding of love and family, brotherly love is what this is talking about. Um, is, is We came into the kingdom with a view of this that was not godly but human. And so our understanding of love in most cases was not one of selfless sacrifice but of emotions and personal needs and desires. That's how we saw love. That's how we saw sexuality, driven by the wrong things. And God calls us to, one, do this right before him, to be pure sexually before him, to be pure uh, in relationship before him. 
and he, and he calls us to love, not in our own strength, not in human love, but in love that's filled with the Spirit, which guides us beyond the boundaries. That's how Jesus could say, bless those who curse you. You know, you, know, you think, Jesus, what are you smoking? Have you ever been around these people? But he says, bless those who curse you because he's pointing you to the kingdom where God's power and rule is in your heart. And now you can do things that are, in a sense, unnatural or supernatural is probably the right way to say it. To bless one who curses you is a supernatural thing to do. It's a very godly thing to do. Yet while we are our sinners, Christ died, sin. Christ died for the ungodly. And we can treat those who don't deserve it that way. Even, even if you're here this morning and you've been healed and you got this on the right track or you got it right, Paul says it to us, excel all the more. Excel all the more. Part of that might be guarding yourself, you know. Yes, they had, it was normal in their society to have temple prostitutes. Different societies have, have normalized things that we would think, whoa, you know. But for them, it was normal. But they would come to us and go, whoa, <laughs> you know, if they saw the internet, you know. Um, and so even if we've been healed and made whole, excel all the more. Go over and beyond. Thrive in this. And if, if we're, we're not fully healed or haven't been healed, well, healing and wholeness awaits us in Christ. It is there for us to have. So I, I encourage you, this is his exhortation. Conduct yourself in a manner that is pleasing to God. That is his call on our lives. That's the Christian lifestyle. It's not, oh, I don't go to movies or... I don't listen to that kind of music. Maybe there's some movies you shouldn't go to and some movies you shouldn't listen, music you shouldn't listen to. But that's not what should define you. Your definition should come from the inside, that you've been transformed by God and you look and say, hey, that's, that's not for me. I'm going to conduct myself differently because of what drives me and motivates me internally. Not my... Uh, carnal or human pleasures and desires for my desire to please God. Amen? Amen. Let's stand together. Father, we do thank you that your word comes to us, God, and uh, speaks to even uh, the most delicate or difficult topics, Lord. Lord, we pray that, that we would see sexuality and uh, relationships with your eyes, God, and that we would be convicted, Lord, of the things that violate what you would want for us, God. And that we would be motivated out of that conviction to live differently, to conduct ourselves in a manner that is pleasing to you, Lord. That we would live worthy of the gospel that we proclaim, Lord. We trust that you're working in us, God. And for those who don't know you, Lord, that might hear what I've said today, Lord, we pray that they would have an have a interest to know how can it be that someone would be this way. Because, Lord, we know that you changed our lives and you can change any life that is willing. And I pray that now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you this morning.